Why don't whales get more cancer? It seems like a bizarre question to ask. But as I'll show, it provides insight into a question about cancer biology we are still struggling to answer. First, we'll need to talk about what cancer is and where it comes from. All living animals that are multicellular develop cancer. Yes, sharks and whales and mice and robins and T-Rexes and dung beetles. Cancer is what happens when the mechanisms in your cells fail to regulate processes of growth and regeneration. Like a tightrope walker with an infinitely long rope, it's not a question of if we will get cancer. It's a matter of when. Each cell is carefully balancing the amount of growth and reproduction it's allowed, and it simply requires a few of those regulatory mechanisms to fail for cancer to develop. Every dividing cell and every tissue capable of renewal or growth is vulnerable. I'll talk about specific mechanisms in another video. Suffice it to say that all it takes to produce cancer is time and cell divisions. The more time and the more cell divisions, the more cancer we would expect to see. That's why it's so puzzling that whales don't get more cancer. They have a cancer rate not much higher than a mouse, but millions of times the cells, and they live hundreds of times as long. It's not possible to count exactly, but we could reasonably project that in growing from a single-celled embryo, they will have experienced millions or billions of times the cell divisions. Among all mammals, from the tiny Etruscan shrew to the blue whale, the cancer rate doesn't seem to vary by more than two or three-fold, in spite of differences in the number of cells, cell divisions, and the long age of larger mammals. This problem is called Pito's Paradox, and it's an area of active research. There are some proposed mechanisms to explain why our predictions from cancer biology don't match the empirically observed data, and that's something I'll cover in the next video. In this video, I simply want to lay out the key theme. Pause here if you want to do some thinking about it before the big reveal. The common theme behind any solution to Pito's paradox is evolution. Here are the cold, hard facts. You weren't built to last. There's an evolutionary detriment to organisms with extremely long lifespans. We can use an unrelated analogy in car designs. Suppose a hypothetical car is made with an engine block that is rated to last 20 years and a drivetrain rated to last 200 years. Even if making the long-lived drivetrain only costs an extra $50, that's a wasted $50. The drivetrain can't be reused. Having it outlive the engine by so much is a needless investment of resources. The car designer would be better off spending those $50 on improving engine life or making more cars. There's a trade-off in expending resources that we're going to call the zero-sum problem, and which biologists call evolutionary trade-offs. Like our car designer, the process of natural selection focuses on the weakest component of a living organism. We can think of an evolutionary lifetime as the time from when the organism is born to when it produces its last offspring. At that point, survival is no longer favored for that organism. Given the zero-sum problem, it makes sense to limit cancer on the basis of an evolutionary life cycle. Any organism that gets cancer and dies before it has a chance to reproduce is selected against. Our giant blue whale is therefore under much stronger selection to develop the anti-cancer strategies we'll talk about in the next video. A small rodent, on the other hand, can afford to have a much higher cancer rate because it can produce offspring at an earlier age. Their relative age and size difference don't impact on cancer rate in the way we would predict from cancer biology because natural selection is balancing out the difference. That's a fairly easy one to puzzle out. A large mammal, during their evolution towards larger size, 
must acquire adaptations and strategies to make sure enough of the population avoids cancer long enough to pass on genes to viable offspring. That means that looking at the largest animals on Earth is going to tell us a great deal about how we can treat the cancer that affects humans in their older age. It's yet another example of how evolution is important to medical researchers. It forms the theoretical basis for much of cancer biology, and in surprising ways that I hope I can talk about in future videos. We talked about why a drivetrain that lasts two centuries isn't of much advantage attached to a two-decade engine, and in fact it would be selected against if it cost even a very small amount to make it so long-lived. Next up, we'll talk about the trade-offs that are likely involved in anti-cancer strategies in multicellular animals. Many of the cellular mechanisms that would have lowered human cancer rates were actively selected against during our evolution, for the same reason that building a two-century drivetrain isn't a good strategy in car design. Is there some way we can improve on the random and unguided process of natural selection in designing therapies? Stay tuned, and thanks for watching.